chapter 5 is a straightforward text. Here's what Paul says. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And we looked at this verse quite a lot last week. I don't want to take a lot of time to redo it, but in case you weren't here, here's what Paul's saying. Uh, don't partake in the things that are connected to the world because they will cause you to lose spiritual energy. That's what dissipation means, to, to lose energy, to, to lose power. But be filled with God's Spirit. And that verse, be filled, in the Greek means to be being filled. In other words, you don't just get filled once. Um, God in his infinite wisdom realized that we would need regular consistent help. And so he provided a way for us to be filled over and over and over again. And so we looked at six characteristics of what it means to be filled with the spirit because during these 40 days after Jesus was raised from the dead, he talks a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. And so 43 days that changed the world is um, the day he gave his life for us, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, and then the 40 days after his resurrection when he taught about the kingdom of God, he taught about the spirit of God, he talk about, talked about the love of God and the forgiveness of God, the power of God. And so there are six things that I want us to look at over um, this series. Last week we spent time talking about that when we are filled with God's spirit, one of the characteristics is that we'll get power for life. Um, Acts chapter one, let me just remind you of it. Acts chapter one, this is Jesus speaking and he says this, but you shall receive power. Everybody say power. You shall receive power when Jesus when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Here's what he says, in order to serve me, in order to witness of me, in order to proclaim the good news to others, you've got to have power. You can't do it on your own. Here's good news. He sent the person of the Holy Spirit who was his exact duplication, replication, and replacement to live on the inside of us so that we could have power for this life. And so we looked at that quite a lot about what it means to have the power of God working in your life. Um, this week I wanna look at the attribute of unity, that when we're filled with God's Spirit, it will cause us to be unified with our brothers and sisters. Let me give you them all. I won't get to them all today. Unity, power, boldness, if you're writing them down, boldness, courage, and wisdom. I think that's six. Um, that's six. Oh, no, I missed one. Joy. Joy and wisdom. Those are the six things that I see that Jesus discusses in these 43 days. In Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at this idea of unity for just a few moments together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, here's what your Bible says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together um, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice the first three words. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. I think three of the most important words in all of the New Testament are these three words. They devoted themselves. This is something that each of us have a responsibility to do, to devote ourselves to the things that matter most to us, to be committed. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was um, on the phone with an individual and we were talking about diet and health and 
this is a, a priority to me to kind of get my gut health in order and so on and so forth. And they said something in that conversation that really captured my attention. And it was in the form of a question. This was how I remember the conversation. It may not be word for word, but this was the impression of the essence of the conversation. The question was, are you really ready to make a commitment to change? Are you ready to make a commitment to change? And they went on to say, are you prepared to stop eating certain things that you enjoy? Are you prepared to face reality? Watch this, this, this made me mad. That you're old enough to where your body is responding differently to food than it used to. That hurt. Because on the, on the inside, in my mind, I wonder if you identify with this, I'm 45, but in my mind, I'm still like in my early 20s. Like in terms of like how I think and energy and so on and so forth, but there are certain things that I do that my body says, oh no, you aren't. Anybody identify? The, the classic example for me is any time I am out of town and rent a car. I don't know what age it happened, but I had to pay close attention at a certain age that by getting in and out of a rental car that I don't pull a hamstring. And it's so embarrassing. And the, the question was, are you committed to this? And I said, yeah, I'm committed. I'm committed. How many of you know that as soon as you commit to something, every demon in hell will come at you about the thing you committed to? <laughs> When it's food that you've committed to, the Twinkie demon, <laughs> the Oreo goblin, like you, you get help. Supernatural it almost feels like from these things. And it tests you as to whether or not you really committed yourself. And we were, <laughs> we were, we were in Branson and I had committed to change. And um, I have a friend who's become like an older brother to me over the last couple of years. His name is Earl. Earl lives in Florida, and Earl's about 10 years older than me. And Earl is um, former military. He's a little bit shorter than me, but he is ripped. I mean, he is, he is jacked. And um, he came to one of the meetings last week, and he brought a, two boxes, two dozen donuts he brought to the meeting. I thought it was rude. I'll be honest. I thought it was rude. <laughs> I thought it was rude. He meant it to be polite, but I thought it was rude. And he knew I was making some efforts. And so what he did when it was, there was a time when it was just the guys, he, um, he, he brought it. He's like, I got donuts. I said, I know. I saw. He said, are you going to get one? I said, no, I don't want one. He's like, you're gonna eat a donut. I said, I'm not eating a donut, Earl. He's like, you are. And he went and he got a donut and he put it on a little napkin and he put it right in front of me. And I said, right in front of me. And I said, Earl, you are the older brother I never wanted. <laughs> and he's sitting there with all of his muscles hanging out of his T-shirt. And I mean, his, his, his shirt's asking for mercy. I mean, it's, like, it's just like about ready to rip right off of him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's, he's everything that the Incredible Hulk is except green. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you need an image of this. He's like the picture of health. And this jack wagon is putting a whole on donut right in front of me. He's like, you're going to eat that donut. I said, I'm not eating the donut. He said, you will eat that donut. I said, I promise you, I will not eat this donut. Meeting goes on, and he's sitting there. It's calling my name. You ever had food call your name? You ever had that happen? That donut, glazed donut, was saying, Josh, you want me bad. <laughs> and the donut was right. I wanted it bad. <laughs> but I had made a commitment. Who did I make a commitment to? Me, you, my family, my kids. My grandkids, the grandkids I don't have yet, I made a commitment that was stronger and deeper than that donut. And that donut sat there and it never got eaten. It never got eaten. Now, yeah, thank you. It was a big deal for me. 
they devoted themselves. I wonder what it would be like for us if we got that zeroed in and focused on our spiritual lives and committed and devoted ourselves to spiritual matters and locked in and no matter what came along to tempt us, we say, no, we've devoted ourselves to something that is more significant, that has more value, that has more meaning, that has the weight and the potential and the capacity to change people's lives. What if we just zeroed in and said, no, I'm devoting myself to that thing. What is that thing? I don't know. I don't know exactly what stage, season, and uh, phase of life that you're in. For some of you, the devotion needs to be, no, we're not going to use our time that way anymore because we've got some things in God that we wanna do. How many of you know you only have so much time? And so you devote yourself to proper time management, devote yourself to proper money management, uh, devote yourself to proper energy management. Uh, For a long time, I had to learn that I had to devote myself to managing my energy. And and managing my energy was more important than managing my time. Um, Because as I've aged, I have less energy than I used to have. Anybody identify? This isn't meant for old people because I'm not old. I said I'm not old. You don't have to believe it. I'm devoting myself to youthfulness, right? So this all plays a part. But I've had to watch because I'll try to manage my daughter's energy based on the lack of energy that I have. And I've had to learn to not judge other people based on my level of energy or lack thereof. I've also had to learn to not judge other people on what they do with their resources and time based on what's important to me. What I'm saying to you is that we all have to come to the point where we make a commitment to something, more importantly, to someone and devote ourselves. Why am I talking about this? Why is it so important? Because when we devote ourselves to the singular purpose of serving humanity and following God, that's what promotes unity within the body of Christ. When you devote yourself to the things that really matter, notice in this text, once they devoted themselves to what? The doctrine, the teaching, the serving of humanity, the making of a difference to the world around them, everything else became less important and the main thing became the main thing. And what I would submit to you is that division creeps in and lack of unity takes hold when you get your eyes off the things that matter and get your eyes focused on less significant things and make secondary things main things. Let me, let me give you, can I give you, can I give you a few examples? Um, and I, I, I might, I might flirt with getting myself into trouble in this, but because I love you and I want to serve and not necessarily impress, um, I wanna just make some observations. Um, As we look around us this early and still early in 2023, it's clear to me that our world is massively plagued by division and conflict. Let, let's consider some of the issues that divide us that we're, we're still grappling with. Race, gender, identity. We are divided by politics, ideologies, philosophies, religion, culture. We're massively divided by these things. Let's, let's look at race for a second. Any, anything you look at, actually, um, the thing that trips us up and gets us off into division and away from unity is having the wrong focus, but even more specifically than just the wrong focus. Um, comparison is the beginning of division. Why? Because when you compare you're setting yourself to come up with one of two conclusions. When you compare, one of two things results. You either end up finding yourself to be superior to the thing or person that you're comparing yourself against, 
or you find yourself to be inferior, less than the thing that you're comparing yourself against. And that right there is the beginning of division. It's how, it's how division begins, and I know there's a lot more layers to it, but just think about race. race is, racism, prejudice, begins when we begin to compare. Let's just, just talk, talk plain. When one colored skin person says they're superior to another color of skin individual, individual, that begins division, does it not? And over a long period of time, if people are taught that they are superior, they're gonna behave a certain way. And if they're taught that they're inferior, they're gonna behave a certain way, all of which is buying into and feeding into division, lack of unity. But let me just give you my opinion about this, and many scientists agree. Um, I think that one way that you get back to unity on race is this. You come to the point where you understand that most science agrees there, is, there are not many races. There's one race, the human race, and the only thing that makes us different is the pigmentation and the color of our skin. But that all men, as one famous man said in a speech, all men are created equal, right? And the moment you buy that you're superior based on the color of another person's skin, you are the one driving the division, okay? But when you get back to the basics, you realize that's different. I love this quote. It says this, prejudice is the emotional commitment to ignorance. Prejudice against anything or anyone. It is the emotional commitment to ignorance. One of the things that bothers me about my hometown, and I, 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 don't, I don't mean this about anyone in this room, but um, I, would, I would tell you that in my experience of pastoring in my hometown for nearly 20 years, racism and prejudice is still very alive and well in Licking County. And that, let me just say this, let me say this as boldly and as plainly as I can, there is no room for racism and prejudice in the body of Christ, it's unacceptable and it's not to be tolerated. So back to the idea of division, race, gender, identity, all of those things. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move on because I can, I can feel the room's resistance and I don't like preaching in resistance, it's no fun. But what if we were to set aside these differences that we have, whatever they are, and focus on what unites us? What if we were to embrace the idea that we are all human and a part of endeavoring to be a part of God's family and live out the calling that he's placed on us? To do this, we have to recognize that our differences are not weaknesses, but their strengths. That being different from one another is a strength and that we, when we understand that, then we begin to see that diversity is a source of, of beauty and it isn't meant to be the source of division and conflict. I know I've said this, but I wanna, I wanna say it again. Um, years ago, Years ago, like over a decade ago, um, we had people, a few people that had come to me and said that um, they didn't like it, that um, people with brown skin, black skin, darker skin than them and their family were attending church here. And that really upset me. That upset me deeply. Um, not only that they felt that way, but that they would have the, they would have the whatever to verbalize it. And my assignment became not to be a champion of a cause, 
but to be the defender of unity and stop division at every turn. That's the assignment of the servant leader is to make sure that the people stay focused on what God is focused on. And if we're busy fussing and fighting over other things, we're forgetting the main thing that while you're upset about whatever you're upset about, and everyone in this room has the capacity and potential to be upset by things. Some of us are more obsessive than others about what we're upset about. And we get locked on it and we get fixed on it. And what I want to say to you is, whatever you're bothered by that's causing you to have conflict and division, I'd like for you to back up and realize one central truth, and that is this, that people in your neighborhood are slipping off into eternity without Jesus at the center of their life, and that is what ought to motivate you, inflame you, and cause you to be passionate. That is what should cause you to devote yourselves to something greater than these minor skirmishes and disagreements and these minor things that we're following off on social media rabbit trails. I have about a 25% of you with me, um, which is fine. Some of you might be thinking, why is this such a big deal? Because this is what's causing division in our country. I will. Thank you, sir. Are there kids in here? There are? That's your fault. There's kids' ministry you should take them to. <laughs> you can explain it to them later. Um, <laughs> this, is what I, this is what I really want to say if you wanna know the truth about it, on this unity and division thing. Um, there are so many of us that have, have beliefs and convictions, and those beliefs and those convictions are distracting you from the real thing. You've, you've, you've bought a lie. I'm gonna say a bad word, okay? I'm gonna do it on purpose. Some of you are focused on a bunch of bullshit. And here's the point I wanna make by saying that. Some of you are more offended that I just said what you think is a profanity than people who are your neighbors and friends that are dying and going to hell. You're more offended by a word that a preacher said than losing a family member and friend off into eternity. And that's what needs to change to bring unity into the body of Christ. That's what needs to change. We've got to see the real thing. If this is your first time here and you love this, this is exactly who we are. It's just, it's just so... It's so crippling to the body to have division riddle us and to be distracted by things and to find our identities in a political party rather than Jesus, the head of the church. That is where our identity ought to be found and sourced at the center of everything that we're doing. I, I need to close because if I carry on, y'all are gonna yell for my re resignation and I'm not gonna do it. You didn't hire me and you can't fire me. <laughs> ah! Unity requires that we let go of our need to be right all the time, humble enough to acknowledge that we don't have all of the answers and that there is value in different perspectives and opinions. We must be willing to find common ground rather than always insisting on our own way. Achieving unity is not easy, but it is possible. Focusing on the right things. Um, I want to finish with this story. A lady went to her pastor and said to the pastor, I won't be going to your church anymore. The pastor responded, but why? Uh, the lady said, I saw a woman gossiping about another member of the church. 
I saw a man that is a hypocrite and flirting with women that aren't his spouse. I observed the worship team living wrong, people looking at their phone during the sermon, young people that are disrespectful amongst a whole lot of other things that are wrong in your church. The pastor replied, okay, I understand. But before you go, do me a favor. Take a glass of water, fill it full, and walk around the church three times without spilling a single drop on the ground. And then, after you do that, leave the church and revoke your membership if you desire. The lady thought to herself, well, that's too easy. She took her glass of water, walked around it three times, just like the pastor asked, and when she finished, she told the pastor she was ready to leave. And the pastor said, I understand, but before you leave, I wanna ask you one more question. When you were walking around the church, did you see any women gossiping? And the lady said, no. Did you see any men that were hypocrites and flirting with you? The lady said, no. She said, did, while you were walking around the building with that glass of water, did you see anyone on their phone not paying attention? No. Did you see any children, young people who were disrespectful? She said, no, I didn't see any of that. The pastor said, do you wanna know why? She said, yeah, I do. He said, because while you were doing that, you were focusing on your walk so that you didn't stumble and spill any of the water out of the glass. You were focused on what you were trying to do and not paying attention to others. You were focused on your walk. Dear friends, it's the same in our life. When we're keeping our eyes on Jesus, we're focused on our walk. We don't have time to see and judge the mistakes that other people are making. We're focused on us. We're focused on doing our thing. We're focused on our walk. That's how unity comes. When they devote themselves. When one person at a time refuses to eat the donut. When one person at a time just says, here's what I'm supposed to be doing. It's not mine to judge how they spend their money or how they talk about me or how they talk about that person. That's their assignment, not my assignment. My assignment is to do what I'm called to do and to walk my walk. The question is, Will we reach out and lend a helping hand and concentrate on our walk? Will we devote ourselves to that? Because I'm convinced of this, when every single one of us does that, the vision melts and unity appears. Because we've got one central focus and it's Him, not each other because you're not called to look like other Christians. You're called to look just like Him. Have you ever felt like God doesn't hear you? That your voice hits the ceiling like the heavens are closed? I've felt that way too. Hello, my name is Josh Pennington and I would love to share with you how I navigated the dry seasons of life in my brand new book called When the Heavens Seem Closed. You can get this book anywhere that books are sold online or at morelifechurch.com. I would love for you to plan a visit to worship with us any Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. at More Life Church.